All right, so we are now recording. Uh, you have a new homework assignment. So there's no lab, quote unquote, today. I will give you a homework assignment that's due in a week. Okay, so I'll describe that. That's the first thing. And uh, it will take some instructions as well. So you, know, you might need to kind of pay attention as I demonstrate how to get started with this homework assignment. So this is the homework assignment that you, that you need to do. You have to turn it in um, basically right before class next Thursday. So you have one week to work on this. Um, and then the content is just a description of what you need to do. Uh, there are some resources that you need to make use of. And um, that's about it. All right. So <clears throat> this assignment involves you know, completing the E10 to E2 function in the C code, which is a link. I'll show you guys you know, how to get to that link. Uh, you can use uh, online GDB to write and test your C program. You can also use online GDB uh, or download the code and use your favorite development tool. So for those of you who prefer to use you know, VS Code, use VS Code. Okay, It's a single file. It's a C program. Uh, if you want to use code blocks, use code blocks. If you have GDB already installed, GCC and GDB installed on your computer, you can use that as well, okay? I personally really like to use online GDB just because it doesn't need any installation. All you need is a browser. So even if you have a Chromebook, you can still get the homework assignment done. All right, so <clears throat> now on to the links. Yes, I will show you, yep. So with this one, it, it takes you to online GDB automatically. So um, I already have an account on online GDB. But if you don't have an account, you know, then you won't see the welcome message here. So let me do this with, uh, in, in a private window so you can see what you will see when you don't have an account uh, with online GDB. So that's, this is what you, you will see. Okay? You will still see the source code. Um, you can still copy and paste the code into a text file if you want to, or you can sign up for an account you know, on online GDB and use online GDB to complete your homework assignment. It's just that when you're all done, when you quote unquote turn in your homework assignment, you still have to turn in a file, okay? But it's pretty easy to download it you know, from online GDB. Okay, so <clears throat> let's just say that you want to do this you know, on online GDB. Um, the first thing you want to do is to sign in. Where is the sign in? I suppose you can, okay, you can fork first. Now, you don't even have to sign in to use it. The problem with not signing in and just doing it like this is if you time out the session, it's not going to be saved. If you forget to copy and paste it into your own you know, computer, it's going to be lost, but you can, you know, do stuff you know, already without having to sign in. So the program does compile. Okay, you can go to debug, and if you're using debug, da, 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 okay, so they give you a guide of how to use a debugger. So if this is the first time you use online GDB, you know, definitely use these links to, to learn how to use the debugger. But I will show you the basic stuff when you want to debug your program. So right there, <clears throat> and I'm going to move this bar, okay? You know, this screen is particularly crowded, particularly uh, crowded because I'm using a lower resolution. If you use a 1080p full resolution on your own computer, you still have more space and you can see more stuff. Okay, so this is called a GDB prompt. It is interactive. You don't have to use the G, uh, GDB prompt for everything. Um, in this case, you can also just you know, put a breakpoint at the function that you're supposed to write. So you go search for the function that you're supposed to write, which is initially right here. And you can put a breakpoint just by clicking on the left-hand side of a line number, like so. Okay, so you now have a breakpoint. Does everybody understand what a breakpoint is in a debugger? Nope. Okay, so a breakpoint means you know when you run the program, it will pause at, on that line. So when execution reaches uh, line 119, execution will pause so that you have a chance to inspect the local variables, the global variables, if any, and also the parameters. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to run the program. The way you run the program is also going to be a little bit special. You have to give it you know, parameters, uh, dash n and then the number that you want to convert. Uh, this particular value is important. I'll explain that later. <clears throat> but basically, when you run it in GDB, you have to use R, which is run, and then dash n 1.23 e negative 45. That those are called um, parameters, you know, to the command to run the program. Basically, you're giving this particular program a string, which is 1.23 lowercase e minus 45, to convert into the base two version. Uh, or to convert it into a base two scientific notation. All right, so we'll press the enter key. So the program is now uh, has run up to the point of line 119, but because I put a breakpoint earlier on line 119, execution has paused. Now the reason why we know the execution has paused is because of the green line. So the green line tells you where we are at when the program has paused mostly because you have a breakpoint. Is that okay? So at this point, um, there are several things you can do. You can make use of the inspector on this side, but we don't, we don't have any local variables, and it does not consider parameters as local variables. So the parameter PN does not show up you know, on the list of local variables. Um, so it's not particularly useful you know, in this case, but you can always use the interactive part to say print something. So in this case, I can ask it to print uh, PN, and PN is the parameter to this whole thing. And PN is not very exciting. I know you guys probably cannot see what is in the dark blue. It's just the address, okay? It's 16 hexadecimal digit. You know, basically it is where the PN parameter, which is a pointer, is pointing to. So that's not going to be particularly useful. What you do want to know is the structure that it is pointing to. So that means you have to dereference the pointer. So you say print asterisk you know, PN, and then it shows you that the structure that PN is pointing to has a few members. It has one member called sine, which is either zero or one. It has a member called coefficient. In this case, it is 123. It has a member called exp10, or the exponent of 10, which is currently negative 47. And it also has an exponent 2, which is currently 0. Are we doing OK so far with this? So you might need to review the concepts here from CISP 360, particularly how to use pointers and how to make use of structures. Okay, because those two concepts are being used in this particular program. Um, and that's about all you need to know in terms of interacting with um, the debugger. Um, I'll, I'll show you a few more things too. So if you want the program to continue execution, you can do a C, you know, which is continue. So if you continue execution, the program will execute, continue, it will continue to execute at full speed until it hits another breakpoint or until the program stops, okay? You can also single step. So single step is just uh, S, or you can make use of the shortcut buttons on the top somewhere. Right here, there we go. <clears throat> so continue C is the same as continue. Uh, step over versus step into. It should not make that much of a difference for your program because you're not writing other subroutines. So whether you're stepping over or stepping into really should not matter all that much. If you do have subroutines, stepping into means you know it will single step into the function, single step into the subroutine that you're calling. It will pause again when you get into the subroutine. Stepping over means it won't stop you know, uh, getting into the subroutine. It will simply stop on the next statement at the same level. Yes? A subroutine and function are the same thing. I'm just a little too old school to call those you know, functions. Subroutine is basically the name of function, same thing. Yeah? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I can definitely do that. Um, so if you want to stop, if, we, if you want to make changes to the program, which I'm going to do right now, you have to stop it first. So after you stop the execution of the program, then you can go back and go you know, into the code here and you can continue to write something here. 
So I'm just going to do something that is totally useless, okay? But nonetheless, I'm going to put it here. So I'm going to, I'm going to say, you know, while x, okay, while one, um, let's make a local variable out here, int x, and we'll just say x plus plus, okay? Yes, this is an infinite loop. I intend it as such, okay? Because I want to show you what happens when you get into an infinite loop and how you can debug an infinite loop, okay? So that's why I intentionally put an infinite loop into the program, just so that I can show you that. So in order to show you how to do, do the step into, I'm gonna go to the main program here. The main program calls E10 to E2 at some point. So I'm going to uh, put a breakpoint on the line before, which is responsible for parsing the string that we pass you know, after the dash N. Okay, so I would do one step over with the parse and then step into with E10 to E2. So this way, you know, you can tell the difference, you know, what, which one is which one. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> All right. So now that I have, you know, made some changes, uh, typically you want to save the program before you run it, just in case something happens and you cannot recover the program. So you want to save the program. Um, but unless you have already signed in, you know, you cannot save the program. So, you know, in order to sign in, you have to log in first, but it can hook up to Google Plus, you know, basically just Google uh, GitHub or Facebook accounts. Um, as far as I know, it does not, you know, spam you with anything. I mean, it's just a really kind of useful tool from my perspective. Anyway, um, let's go ahead and debug the program. Do not run it, okay? Running is not gonna help you. You should be debugging it. So there we go. We it kept the breakpoints that I had earlier, which is fine. I can probably go back and delete the other breakpoint because I want to show you guys how to debug an infinite loop. So I'm taking that breakpoint away. And now I can uh, run the program and with a dash n 1.23 e negative 45. If you don't give it anything, it will give you an error message, okay? The program is written in a way where if you don't give it a number to process, it will just go like, hey, I'm supposed to get something to process, okay? So you remember to give it like dash n 1.23e negative 45 or some other floating point number. Press the enter key and now we are getting, <clears throat> now we are on line 165 because you can see the green box is surrounding line 165. So execution has stopped, or paused, I should say, has paused at this point, which means, you know, I can now take a look at what is number string. I can take a look at what is n. I can take a look at you know, all the other local variables. Now, since they're local variables, they're already here. So that's pretty handy. I can see that n is a structure. It has sign as a member, coefficient as a member, exp10 as a member, ext, exp2 as a member at this point because I have not even started to parse the number yet. The number that I'm going to parse is a string and it is just you know, 1.23 lowercase e negative 45, which is exactly what I typed earlier on the command line. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay, yep. <clears throat> What did I do? I just you know, type R dash N 1.23 E negative 45 and then press the enter key. That starts to run the program with the parameter of your know, 1.23 E negative 45. So you can give it a different floating point number to process if you want to, but I'm going to use, I'm going to use this particular value because there are other parts of the homework description that are specific to this number. So I just want to keep using the same number. Hmm? Not, well, the dash end is something that I choose, you know, as a, what we call a flag to basically say whatever number is following is the number that I want to process. It doesn't have to be dash end. I just wrote that part of the program to use dash end to indicate whatever follows is the number to convert. <clears throat> All right. So now I can demonstrate, you know, what is stepping over, which is also, you know, if you type N on the keyboard and then press the enter key, it is the same as stepping over. So, but you can also just click this button, which is step over. 
So when you step over, it simply means it will call the subroutine, it will call the function, but it won't stop in the function that you're calling because it's not the function that you need to debug. So you just go like, okay, we'll just go ahead and run this new function without stopping. Does that answer your question? Okay. So now we want to step into E2 to E10 to E2 because that's the one function that you have to complete. Yes. Yes, it will. All right, so now we are ready to step into uh, E10 to E2. So this time I use step into, and you can also see the text equivalent command to do a step over, which is next. Uh, next can be abbreviated as just N and then followed by the enter key, or you can just you know, keep pressing the buttons if you want to. Single stepping or stepping into is your know, step step as a command, but you can also use this button. So what, it, what happens now is it will call the function, but then it will stop at the very beginning of the function that you're calling, like that. So now we are in the loop, and obviously this is an infinite loop. It will never exit. So many people, when they do this homework assignment, will inadvertently you know, put themselves into an infinite loop which is fairly normal. So the question is, if your program is not completing because it's in an infinite loop, what are you going to do? So what I'll do now is I will continue execution, which means it will run the program at full speed unless it hits a breakpoint. And there are no breakpoints here anymore within the tight loop. So if I type continue, it will just go like, okay, we'll keep going and going and going. So, it, which is not very helpful. So what you can do is now type the control C, com uh, con type control C uh, over here. I think there's a way to pause it here too by pressing the pause key. So either one will do the trick. I typically just type control C like that. And then what happens is it will show you, the green box will, con will show you where it is breaking execution. So since you know, this is a really tight, you know, small loop, there's only one place it can stop. But if you have a conditional statement inside a loop, inside another loop, and that outer loop is an infinite loop, it will stop at whatever place you know, that statement turns out to be. Then you can use single step to basically check out why is it not exiting, okay? So you can single step and go like, okay, it goes from here to here, and it goes from here to here, but it's supposed to get out. Why is it not getting out, okay? And you can now inspect you know, the local variables if you have any local variables, yeah? It won't make any difference whether you're stepping over or stepping into because you're not calling another function. So it only makes a difference when you are about to call a function. If you're not calling a function, then stepping over and stepping into would make no difference whatsoever. You can use either one. Okay. So at this point, you know, you can say, okay, you know, my program is not exiting. What is the value of x? Okay, x is some value. It's not relevant, okay, because it doesn't really do anything with um, whatever pn is pointing to. So you can also say, you know, what is inside pn? You know, what is the structure the pn is pointing to? It shows you all the, the values of the members and so on. Now, print is actually extremely helpful because you can do something like this. You can say print uh, pn points to coefficient times two. In other words, you can type any expression you want after print and it will evaluate that expression. So if you want to say, hey, if this is this less than that, you can type that expression. So that's really helpful in debugging because sometimes you know, visually you cannot really tell whether a number, you know, both two numbers are gigantic. You cannot tell one whether one is less than the other one, but you can also you know, just type, you know, whether something is less than, okay, so if I want to, okay, is this less than, you know, 4,000, okay, it will tell you, yes, it is less than 4,000. Yep. Uh, yes, you can, um, you can call a function when you're in print. <clears throat> so, do we have any questions about using a debugger? I'm really kind of shocked the first time when people tell me, no, we have not been introduced to use debuggers, and that's you know, in CISP 440. So that means people have taken all the way up to 430 already, and yet 
they were not exposed to the concept of using a debugger. It's really a great tool to help you develop and debug programs. Because the only alternative is C out. You just print a lot of stuff out. And this is a much better way. I think it's, it's a better way. Yes? Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm hmm. What do you mean by holding on to the previous one? So you, you never lose a breakpoint after you get past the breakpoint, it's still there. So uh-huh. So no, it would not. It would not unless you know it is a loop, you know, at the caller and it goes back to the line that contains the breakpoint, then it will stop. Mm -hmm. that has a breakpoint within its process, it's going to ignore that? It does not ignore that. It will stop at the breakpoint in the function that you're calling. Okay. Even if you say step over, so it, it will, will still stop. stop. Yep, mm -hmm. okay. exactly. All right. So GDB is not a, uh, it's awkward to many of you because you have never been exposed to it. But industry-wide, you know, GDB is a fairly well-known tool. So for those of you who want to learn more about using GDB, you can just you know, search for like tutorial, GDB, something like that. You know, just walk through with examples. Or if you want to you know, kind of play with chat and GBT, um, okay, this doesn't work because this is a private window. And I have to go back to the one where I have already signed in. Let me get back to... That one. Oh, nope. Where is that one? Is that the one? Yep, this is the one. Okay. So you can probably go to ChatGPT and ask questions about how to use your GDB. You can say, um, how do I <clears throat> inspect a variable in GDB? In GDB, which is you know, GNU, oh, look at that. It gives you like everything you need to know. I don't need to teach my classes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just give Ch ChatGPT a bunch of prompts and just walk away slowly. It does? The text-to-speech? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so anyway, great resource, okay? You know, combining chat GPT as an interactive tutor and GDB, which can help you debug the program. Um, all right, so now that we have gotten the mechanical stuff done, <clears throat> let me go back to the other window because I want to go back to the one where it is, uh, where I haven't signed in, okay? Getting back to this one. Okay, so the question is, uh, now that we know the basics of debugging a function, what is the function supposed to do? Okay, that is the question. So that part is explained in the assignment description. So I'm switching back to the assignment description here, and I'm just going to read this whole thing. I mean, if you want to, you can feed this whole thing into your know, chat GPT and see what's, what, what it comes back with. Um, even if it comes back with the correct code, it's not going to help you in the next exam. So I strongly recommend people to actually do it yourself, okay? You know, because even if ChatGPT can help you and give you the code, um, you know, what you're supposed to learn in the process of writing this code is going to help you in exam two, because I guarantee you there will be one question on the double precision floating point number format in exam two. So, all right. <clears throat> so your code as function e2 to e10 should take the struct float pointed to by parameter pn and preserve the value blah, 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 okay? So this blah, 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 blah is referring to the sign, the coefficient, 
and also the exponent of 2 as well as the exponent of 10. These are shorthands. They are fully explained down here. So V is the product of the sign. If the sign is a 1, then you use negative 1 as a multiplier. If the sign is a 0, then you use 1 as a multiplier. The coefficient is the member coefficient in the structure pointed to by Pn. E10, or the exponent of 10, is Exp10 as a member of the structure pointed to by Pn. E2 corresponds to Exp2. Um, the sign is the sign, and so on. Okay, so there, it's fully explained here, okay, you know, how the symbols you know, in the equation relate to the members of the structure that is pointed to by Pn as a parameter. Um, you are supposed to preserve V as you make changes. Um, your entire program should not use anything with, that relies on float, double, or functions from math.h. So that means if I see the type, you know, double or float anywhere within the, within the program, I won't even grade that particular program, okay? Because you won't need it. You are not going to need it. Um, in, let's see here. The resulting coefficient, this is the, actually the most important part. The, co the resulting coefficient C should make the condition blah, blah, blah true. So two times the coefficient should be greater than 2 to the power of 64 minus 1. Okay, so that's one requirement. V should be preserved as much as possible. Um, and then EXP10 should be a zero when your algorithm, when your, when your code is done. So those are the basic requirements. Do we have any questions about what your program is supposed to accomplish? Yes. You are going to write the entire function, so I give you the shell of the function, but you are supposed to write all the code inside. It's not going to be that many, okay? I think it's going to vary between, you know, 10 to 15 lines at the most. Yes, I do have some clues to help you with that. Okay, so I'm just going to, I'm getting to that part, but good questions. All right. <clears throat> so in the GDB console of online GDB, do the following, which I have already shown you. So this part is already shown. Um, to submit, turn in the entire source file. So that means if you are doing this with online GDB, you have to download your code back into a file and turn it in into the submission, you know, choose a file you know, interface. Um, so this last part here is designed to help you to structure the loop um, so that you can check your code. The following command, run, you know, do the following command in GDB. Oh, so this is exactly what I have used, okay? Run uh, dash n 1.23e negative 45, and your program should update the members of the structure in this particular way. So I would just right click and do a new tab. Okay, maybe I didn't do that. Maybe I did. Yep, there we go. So this shows you step by step how the coefficient, okay, it's not showing the entire thing because the, <clears throat> it's cutting off one portion. Ugh, okay, come on. Nope. All right, so what we can do, okay, I can, I can fix this. Copy and paste it into mouse pad, and then show mouse pad here. There we go. All right, same thing, except, you know, it's a smaller window this time. So this shows you the sequence of how things should be changed as your code runs, as E10 to E2 runs. This is what should have it should happen. The coefficient uh, would change from 123 to 246 because the coefficient is the numerator or the um, dividend. It's being divided. So the purpose is we want to maximize the dividend before we do a division. All right? But every time you double the coefficient, you have to change exp2 so that the value, which is V being represented, does not change. So you keep doing this until co the coefficient cannot be doubled anymore. So this is going to take a while. 
So you can see that at some point right here, the coefficient cannot be doubled anymore. This is the largest uh, coefficient that you can have because if you double again, it cannot be stored in 64 bits anymore. So how do you specify that condition so that you know, you know that, oh, okay, we cannot double anymore. You kind of have to think about that a little bit, okay? So we'll, that's one of the things you have to think about. Yes? Are we allowed to use comparison? Yes, you can use comparison, just not the type float or double. So you cannot cast anything to a double or float before you compare. But you can still compare as integers, not a problem. All right, so, <clears throat> so what happens next is really important because these two lines basically says, this is the last time we double the coefficient. And we also you know, make a matching change to the exponent of two because every time you double the coefficient, you have to do something so that the value V is preserved. What happens next has to do with the division by 10. So when you look at this particular coefficient, it is divide, it's basically this coefficient divided by 10, but with rounding, okay? So now this is where you tie in everything that we have learned up to this point from the two labs, okay? Because I, somebody asked, you know, on the on Discord, like, how we, I don't see how this is relevant. Eh, this is sort of why it is relevant, okay? So we are using a loop to do what log would do otherwise, but this way we are not using, you know, a floating point or double, you know, precision you know, operations, and therefore it is efficient on a processor that can only do integer math. So this transition is really important, okay, because you have to know when to stop doubling, and after you stop doubling, then you divide it by 10 with rounding, but since you're dividing it by 10, so that means the exponent of 10 can be adjusted to be one step closer to become zero. Okay, the whole idea is we, you want to preserve V as much as possible. V is the value being represented. Is that okay? So, this actually is really long, okay? Well, it's not super long, but it's kind of long. But it keeps going and going and going until, um, until uh, EXP10, you know, changes to zero, and, you know, the coefficient becomes this number, but you don't stop there because the homework assignment specifies that the coefficient, that two times the coefficient is going to be greater than two to the power of 64 minus one. If you multiply this number by two, it is not going to be greater than two to the power of 64 minus one. So I keep doubling it a few more times until it goes like, okay, at this point, I cannot double anymore. Then you stop. In other words, this entire log is helping you to debug your code, okay? So when you are writing your code, you need to make sure that your code is making the same kind of changes to the members of the structure the PN is pointing to. Um, there are many ways to organize the code, okay? So whether you use a loop in the loop, a condition in the loop, two conditions in the loop, nested conditions in the loop, there are many ways to do it, okay? The bottom line is, whatever you do, you should be making changes to the members in a very similar way. Now, there are things you can change, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be in this particular order. You can change EXP2 before you change the coefficient, okay? So the ordering is not necessarily, they have to be exactly the same, so there are certain things here where the ordering can change. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so this log file is really helpful. I hope it is going to be helpful because by observing you know, how the values are being changed, I think many of you can formulate the control structure in the head already. Okay, yep. Um, sure. Okay, so there are two things that are important. Uh, let me go back to the lab description here. Because in the lab description or the homework description, it says you know, one of the requirements is the resulting coefficient C should make the condition blah, blah, blah true. 
So if your C, if your coefficient turns out to be too small, this won't be true and points will be deducted. So that means, you know, in the log, okay, if you go all the way to the end of the log, after the last division by 10, this is the original coefficient. This is that coefficient divided by 10 with rounding. But this number is not large enough. In other words, if I double this particular number, the one that's, that's highlighted right now, it's not going to exceed 2 to the power of 64 minus 1. So as a, because that's part of the requirement of the homework assignment, so I cannot just say, oh, we, we can stop here, because I have to keep doubling it until it cannot be doubled anymore. So that's why I have some leftover doubling to do, you know, after this. Um, it is, it's put in through there because I want to use, you know, uh, all 64 bits, quote unquote, as the mantissa. It's not really truly the mantissa, but it is the coefficient. There was a hand back there. Two. Okay, so you go first and then him. Yep, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Um, you can change it to C++ if you want to. I don't see any reason why you have to shift to C++. Yeah, so you can change you know, the language to C++ if you want to, and there are multiple um, variants of C++ along with Turbo C. You guys, are, when Turbo C was around, you most of you were not born yet, so just forget about those options. <clears throat> I just you know, use regular C. There, there's, there's, there should be no reason to change to C++ unless you want to resort back to C out as a way to debug your program, which I'm not going to stop you. I do not stand between you, the shotgun, and your foot. Uh, you first, and then you. Go ahead. Because I will give you test cases where I know what the answer is supposed to be, and I will stop the program right at the end of the function, and I will check whether it is the right value or not. So I don't really even care how it gets in there. I will read the code, okay, because you know, that's how I can find out, hey, these two programs are awkward exactly the same way. What is happening here? Okay, so I will read the code, okay? But when I test the program, it is based on the few test cases that I come up with where I have my own code to generate the key, and then I will compare my key to what your code is giving back to me. So that means your code doesn't have to generate the log at all. The log that you saw, okay, let me go back to the log here. So this log is strictly for you to debug your program and also to give you an idea of how the uh, control structure should be organized. Eh, I can script some of that. <laughs> I'll just upload all your programs to chat GPT and say, grade them. <laughs> and find you know, the programs that look you know, very much alike. Yeah. Go ahead. C or C++, basically. Uh, C++ is object-oriented. You can have classes, and then you can have all the fancy stuff in C++. C is kind of the original programming language that quote unquote inspired C++. Um, for this particular program, there's no need to do any type of you know, object-oriented programming. So that means you know, I don't see any particular reason to change to C++. The only reason, as I said a little bit earlier, is because people are used to C out, and that's how they print stuff out, and they don't want to learn how to use printf, which is the C way of printing stuff. So I can see that being the only reason why people may want to switch to C++, which is fine with me. You can switch it to C++ and you know, it, it doesn't bother me at all. Any other questions? The code itself is eh, around 15 lines or so. Um, so it's not a very long program. It is related to what we have talked about, okay? You know, all that stuff about uh, rounding, okay, all that stuff about 
you know, doubling and so on and so forth, those are all related to this particular program. There's one more thing that you might want to look into as well. You know, this is also a resource that you can look into. It is the standard integer .h you know, um, header file because it has a lot of macros already defined. Uh, so if you look through this stuff here, un64 underscore t, you know, these are the types that are defined in this particular header file. So that's useful. But it also defines macros for the maximum value for each type, which I'm not going to tell you because I want you guys to look through this to look for it. Obviously, you can also ask, you know, chat GPT. So you can ask chat GPT, like, what is the macro for the maximum value of this particular type? And I'm pretty sure chat GPT, chat GPT should be able to answer that question. But I think having your own skill to go through a document like this to find those definitions is a is still a useful skill. Okay, so you know, do whatever you want, you know, because you know, you're gonna need. It would be handy to know those macros. Yes. Um, well, what we are doing in the loop is kind of doing the power function, but you know, it is only doing it as much as we need. Um, the power function is not going to be particularly useful unless you have log, and there's no you cannot use log here. So that means you know the power function is not going to be particularly useful. You basically use a loop to keep doubling until you go like, oh, okay, you know this is where we need to stop. Yep. Go ahead. Yes, we will have a lab Tuesday because we will continue in today's lecture to talk about stuff where on Tuesday we can have a lab to kind of work with that stuff. But today I may or may not have enough time to get to the point to do that lab that will be on next Tuesday. So I don't want to <clears throat> rush today's lecture. So that's why I want to put that lab on next Tuesday instead of today. There's a chance that I can finish enough material for that lab to happen, but I don't want to rush. All right, any other questions? So you actually get to some, write some code now, which is what some people complain about this class. It's like, we don't ever get to write some code. Here we go, yes. You can use constants, yeah, but that's already defined in standard integer.h. You can define your own if you want to, but it is just as easy to use the one that's already defined. All right. Any other questions? All right, so about today's lab, okay? <clears throat> if you want to just go home, you know, to start your weekend early, that's fine with me, okay? I'm not gonna take a road, you know, and see who's in the lab. On the other hand, if you just, you know, gather all this, you know, all this information and you're already formulating a solution and you just want to get it done so that your weekend doesn't have to be uh, you don't have to worry about you know, doing this lab you know, over the weekend, I will be over at the lab. Okay, so for those of you who want to code this thing today, I will be at the lab. If you run into you know, situations, you know, I'll be around to kind of give you some answers and pointers. Yep. Um, yes. The next lab is going to have some specific activity related to the material that we'll go over, you know, like in a few minutes. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't push, you know, the homework assignment, you're doing the homework assignment to next Tuesday. Right. Yep. <clears throat> um, and because we just talked about it, it's fresh in your mind. It's good to at least, you know, give it a few attempts, you know, at this point, just so that th those ideas, you know, sink in. Um, and you, maybe you get stuck at a certain point, and then you go home, you know, so that you can kind of put it in, in the back burner to kind of you know, let it soak a little bit. All right. So any other questions about this lab or homework assignment? Because it's due in a week. Yep. It's only negative for this one. Yep, it's only going to test negative exponents. Yep. 
Any other questions? So it's due in about seven days, which give people like plenty of time to pro procrastinate and then panic. Yep. <laughs> I have to mention that because I know people like that. No, that's not me. I'm actually, I quite enjoy the pressure. You know how the, you know, in interviews, you know, they will ask you, know, you can, can you work under pressure? You know, my answer is I only work under pressure. <laughs> <clears throat> Which is not what they want to hear either. It's like, no, we don't want to hear this. That's not the answer we're looking for. I only work under pressure, okay? So how much time do we have until it's due? About three hours? Uh, maybe I'll start in about an hour. <laughs> I used to go to uh, programming contests. Uh, they still organize those things. It's not the same thing as a um, hackathon. Hackathons are a little bit too fuzzy and too flexible for me, you know, because you know, they don't really give you the objective of what you need to do. They just say, this is our product, okay? This is uh, Twilio, okay? This is the API to Twilio. Do something funky with it, okay? It's like, oh. On the other hand, if they say, this is exactly the problem, we want you to figure out you know, the exact answer to this kind of problem, now that is my kind of problem. Um, yeah, uh, the ACM you know, still organize your know, student uh, programming contests. So for those of you who are interested in participating in real programming contests, you, you can join the local ACM. The Los Rios you know, district actually has a local chapter for the ACM. I think they have a Discord presence as well. So look into that if this is something that you want to do, is to join the local chapter of ACM and they organize uh, competitions, you know, um, I, I cannot remember how many times a year, but those are those are really kind of <laughs> competitive events, you know, because you're they compete by they give you like your know, ten problems and you have teams, um, and then they would time you know each team how long it takes to solve the problems. If no team can solve all ten problems, then they look at you know how how much time to solve how many problems. They have a they have a, an entire way of grading, you know, the performance of the teams. So everything is kind of pretty well defined, which which is what I like about those you know, events. Instead of hackathons, which is kind of like, just do something cool with our product. Do you guys know what is the main purpose of hackathons? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, uh, yes. They want to collect resumes, okay? So you know, every single hackathon would actually ask people to turn in their, their resume. And the second purpose is to get rid of uh, caffeinated products that won't sell. I'm not kidding you. I went to a, an event like a, a hackathon organized by San Francisco State University, and uh, they served us you know, Costco pizza and energy drink. The energy drink is not something that you recognize. It's not Red Bull. It's not anything that you find on the shelves in any store. It's like really awkward you know, brands and products, and it tastes like, I cannot use that word in class. <clears throat> so, you know, I think it, this is the other purpose of these hackathons. It's like, oh, we got all of these energy drinks that we cannot sell. What are we going to do? Oh, just kind of put those in the hackathon events. You know, people will drink it anyway because there's nothing else to drink. Sorry? Off Say that again? Off oh. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the pizza stuff is funny too. You know, Costco pizza doesn't cost a lot of money. And that particular event was sponsored partially by Google. And they go like, okay, you can only take one piece. Go like, really? Just one piece? This is Costco pizza. It's not that expensive. And then later on, they say, okay, anyone who wants second now can come. And people just go, no, we are not going to finish that pizza anymore. Pretty funny. All right. So we are moving on to something else now. Okay, so we are at the point of we are done with how things are represented. Okay, integers, signed versus unsigned. Um, things that are not integers, like, you know, real numbers, well, sort of real numbers. 
So we are moving on to the next big module. I know the way I organize these modules is not how most other classes organize modules, but we are moving on to the von Neumann uh, architecture and memory. So not sure how many people know the, of the term von Neumann, or von Neumann, von Neumann. Okay, so I think that's the proper pronunciation. So we can look up this guy, okay? His name is John, John von Bonneman, John Bonneman. There we go. And Wikipedia has a pretty good page on him, and it's long. Just look at the uh, the thumbnail here. This is a really long article. That's because you know he is a genius in almost everything STEM. Um, if you look at you know what he's good at, okay, just take a look here. Um, he made major contributions to many fields, including, which means this is not even exhaustive, mathematics, physics, economics, computing, and statistics. And if you ask anyone at that time of each of those fields about, you know, so what do you think of John Bonneman? They go like, oh, he's a genius. So he is good at everything. Unfortunately, he didn't live very long. <clears throat> If you look at his uh, birth and death, okay, he was, let's see, down here. So he was 50, what, four when he passed away? That's really young, because I'm 56. <laughs> the reason why he passed away so early, uh, most people you know, uh, have a conjecture that it's because he was he participated in the hydrogen bomb project, and he got exposed to radiation, and he just died of cancer as a result. So anyway, so what is his contribution in computer science? What would computers look like without John Bornemann's contribution? That would be a good question to ask, because most of you cannot even conceive what computers would look like or how they would operate without this guy. Because how do you reprogram a computer so that you can change the way it gets things done? You guys go like, I have no idea. The, the phone just does that automatically, right? Over the air updates, I don't have to pay attention at all. Before his time, if computers, the behavior or how a computer operates, you know, how you specify the behavior of a computer program, is by hard wiring. In other words, at the back of the circuit board, there'll be like a bazillion wires, okay? And how those wires are interconnecting the components is dictating how the computer performs the computations. If you want to change the way a particular computation should be done, you have to change the actual physical wiring. I don't think you guys can even you know, imagine what it looks like. So I'm going to give you some pictures. <clears throat> so we will look at wire wrap computers from the 19, I would say about probably about the 50s. Yeah, that looks about right. So. If you want to change the program, the first thing you need to do is to figure out which wires you want to change. And because you know, some of these wires are on top of the other ones, so that means you, know, you have to unwire a lot more than what you really have to change because you know, they are stacked up on, on top of each other. And that's how you change a program. Yes. There's no such thing as software. <laughs> the only way, they do have memory back in those times. The memory was used strictly to store numbers, the numbers that are being processed. So let's say you have a naval application of a computer, which was actually one of the main thing that these computers were used for, was to calculate the trajectory of shells. So if you want to change you know, the way it's computed, or you want to change you know, the coefficients and whatnot, you literally have to go in and make changes to the wires. 
but the, there's no such thing as software. There's the, the instructions, what the computer is supposed to do is not soft or even firm. Just like tofu, there's, there's hard, there's firm, and then there's soft. So back in those days, hmm? <laughs> so back in those days, it's all hard, okay? There's no firm, because we know, do you guys know what is firmware? No? No, no, no. Okay, drivers are not exactly firmware because they are software. They are actually running on the computer in the memory. So firmware refers to things that are most of the time not going to be changed. So your phone comes with certain types of firmware. Um, the, the certain phones cannot be bricked, B-R-I-C-K-E-D, not, not broken, okay? So does anyone know that term, you know, a phone being bricked? What does it mean? No. Sorry? Exactly, it's full barred. But I cannot tell you what full barred really means in this class, not in, a, not in a lecture. So anyway, so some people like to mod stuff, okay? So they buy a Nintendo Wii, they buy a your cell phone, they go like, oh, I can install a different operating system that's better, okay? But sometimes in the process of overwriting the original operating system over the flash memory, they would get to the point where the phone cannot be rebooted anymore and it cannot be rescued anymore, cannot be recovered anymore. Certain phones are like that. Other phones, you know, intrinsically have a design where the firmware, okay, once again, firmware, is hard, is uh, cannot be corrupted. You know, there's a certain portion of the program in the cell phone that is hardwired, okay? Not exactly hardwired, but it's, it's in a ROM. It's in read-only memory, and that part cannot be overwritten. So you can always at least get to that part of the phone and then reload everything else on top of it. Okay, so firmware refers to um, programming that is not going to be updated frequently, okay? Typically, you know, it can, some may not even be reprogrammable, and others can be reprogrammable only very occasionally. That's firmware. Software, you know what software is already. You know, software is the things that you, when you install an app, that's software. So if you look at this whole thing, there's no firmware. Everything is hardwired. You use RAM, you use memory only for calculation purposes. Yes? How do you make sure that firmware How do you make sure that? Firmware um, does They certainly would have bugs, you know, but those bugs would not be severe enough that the device cannot reboot. Yep. It depends at which level. So the bootstrap your know, program on the phone, it is not considered an operating system. It's considered you know, just firmware because it, it's not, it doesn't give you a lot, okay? Um, all it can do is to start up. It can write to the screen. It can interpret the touch you know, sensor. Um, it can find where memory is. It can find you know, how much memory it has. Um, it might be able to get onto to the network or talk to the USB port, and that's about it. But that's already enough for you to hook it up to a normal PC running ADB, or in Android it's ADB, so that you can you know, upload a new image on top of the firmware, which is going to be the usual, you know, typical Android operating system. So that you know, bootstrap, the recovery software on the phone is typically not considered an operating system. But it can be a full operating system in certain cases. It's just that people don't, people don't want to spend too much money to put the entire operating system into the ROM because it's not necessary. So does that kind of answer the question? Okay. All right, so if computers still look and behave like this, we wouldn't have this or this, right? Because you know, how do you update and change the software running on these things? There's no software. If you want to change your Fitbit to do something else, well, guess what you need to do? You take off your Fitbit, you open up the case, 
and there'll be a bazillion tiny little wires <laughs> that you have to rewire in order to make it do something different. That would not be fun. That would not be possible. It would not be practical. So John Bonneman's you know, contribution is simply the idea of how about we store instructions in the very same memory that we already use to store data. That was his contribution. So now the instruction, which is telling the computer how to do things, is no longer hardwired into the computer. It is now, quote unquote, living in RAM or read only read access, uh, random access memory, where it can be changed. So you can use communication equipment and say, here's a new program, okay? Change your program to this, and you can do it remotely. So that was his contribution. But it changes you know, how computers are organized you know, as a result. So this is important because you know, this entire ch uh, module in here talks about memory and how it is utilized in order for programs to execute from memory, which we all take for granted, you know, simply because you know, we are in the, what, 2020s, okay? So that means you know, we are well past you know, John Barnum's you know, age, I mean, uh, his time, and as a result, you know, we don't have any recollection. I don't have any recollection of computers that are hardwired, okay? You know, just because that's, that's in the past. But without his contribution, we wouldn't have computers the way we do now. We wouldn't be able to update you know, software remotely over the network and so on and so forth. Um, it would be the, the progress of computing would have been a lot slower without this contribution. So are we good so far in terms of you know, why his contribution is critical in computer science? Yes. That is a great question. I do not know. <clears throat> so let's go look for architecture. All right. So von Neumann, consulted for the Army's Ballistic Research Lab, most notably, blah, 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 on the ENIAC project, as a member of a scientific advisory committee. Although the single memory stored program architecture is commonly called von Neumann architecture, the architecture was based on the work of this person, that person, and so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah. So I think the ENIAC may be one of the first programmable computers. Yep, that's, that's what it says. So he did implement it. He, he, huh? Yes. Yep. Yep. So, and he was, he was not the only person who came up with the idea. So it was probably a team that came up with the idea and implemented that in the ENIAC uh, computer which was the first quote unquote programmable computer in terms of changing the memory content to change the behavior of the program of the of the computer so good question very good question there <clears throat> all right so now we switch gear to talk about details so we are going to talk about the flip flop and other basic memory devices in other words how does a computer store data how does it remember the zeros and ones how can, you know, how do you change a zero into a one how do you change a one into a zero okay so that's those are the questions that we want to answer here let's go take row first and then we'll come back and try to finish as much as we can so i did not you know, get enough time to talk about the entire thing so it was a good thing that i did not you know put the lab on tuesday today because we wouldn't have enough time to do it all right, this is for road taking today, and the access code is LEAP. I only get to use this word as an access code every four years. Exactly. <laughs> I can only use it when I have a class on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So that means you know, out of the seven days of a week, you know, uh, 
three times out of seven of a leap year, I cannot use it. And then one, every 100 years, I cannot use it. Hmm? The first day? Oh, you have a mechanical watch? Oh, it, if it doesn't know the year, then it cannot account for leap year. Hmm? Yeah, if it doesn't have the year, then it, it cannot possibly know it's a leap year. Yep. All right, so I'm assuming that you guys have taken row already. So we'll go to the D flip-flop discussion, which I think is actually quite interesting. <clears throat> Everything about this class is interesting. Otherwise, I wouldn't be teaching it. Or oh, interesting to me. Okay, you maybe may not be interesting to everybody. All right. So this is how I describe an SR latch. You know, I think I got enough time to actually show you how it works in Logisim. So I'm describing a circuit using text. It looks like a program. So we have two NAND2 gates. One is called N1 and one is called N2. This is, by the way, C++-ish code. So N, NAND2, you know, with the uppercase N, is the class name. And we are creating two instances of that. And one is called N1 and the other one is called N2. Uh, input pin, once again, is a class. It has two objects. You know, one is S and one is R. Output pin, same thing. We have Q and NQ as the output pins. And then the rest is you know, basically using a circuit object, and we are adding uh, nodes you know, in the circuit. A node is basically um, the same copper or the same conductor on a circuit. It interconnects multiple ports of different parts of different chips together. Okay? So let me just kind of show you what this looks like in Logisim, then you will understand what I mean by a node. All right, so let's go start up larger sim. Okay. <clears throat> there we go, and we can. Okay. I want to resize it. Okay. Resize. Okay. There we go. Because I want to show both this uh, this this source code, this quote unquote source code and the circuit at the same time. Now there are actual programming languages, quote unquote programming languages, where its only job, I shouldn't say only job, but its main job is to describe a circuit. Because in industry, you know, can you imagine the complexity of a typical processor today? An i7 chip. It's crazy, okay, it's crazy complicated. So we cannot just say, okay, let's draw a picture you know, of all the components and how they are interconnected. That's not gonna be a very good idea. So that's why you know, in industry, the actual circuitry inside the processor is described by what we call an HDL, or Hardware Description Language, HDL. There are two industry HDLs. One is called Verilog, V-E-R-I-L-O-G. The other one is called VHDL which means, uh, I cannot remember what the V stands for, but HDL is Hardware Description Language. So for anyone who is planning to transfer to UC Berkeley, um, the final year project in EECS involves using one of those two programming languages to specify a fairly modern feature of which your processor. So, yeah, so this stuff is not something that I invented, okay? This is actually, used in industry, just not exactly the same syntax. All right, so we are going to make this entire thing. Okay, so we'll pick out two NAND gates, okay? And every single one is gonna be a little bit too big, too many inputs, that's what we want. And we want two of these, okay? And I'm gonna follow the names you know, in, <clears throat> in the text description. One is N1 and the other one is N2. We are going to have two input pins. Okay, so here's one, and here is the other one. 
And then I will turn off simulation, yeah, you know, just so that we cannot see what's going on here you know, when these are connected. Um, then we name the pins. This one is called S, and this one is called R. Then we have two output pins. Um, one is Q and one is NQ. This is Q, <clears throat> and then this is NQ. All right. So I'm just building a circuit based on the text description here. Now, what a node is, is it is a way to specify how the pins or how the ports are connected. So this is telling me the input pin S is supposed to connect to the first input of the N1, okay? So this wire is corresponding to the first node. R is supposed to connect to the second input pin of N2, okay? Well, that's, uh, this is the second node. So these are more important. These are more interesting because what we have here is the output of N1 connects to Q as an output pin, but it also goes back to the first input of N2. So this is the first time we see what we call, you know, what looks like a feedback, okay? Because you know this pin ultimately goes back to here. And then the other pin, which is this one here, the other node, I should say, is going back to N1. So we have kind of a messy, loopy kind of thingy here, okay? So the question now is, how do we describe the behavior of this little circuit here? And how does it, quote unquote, remember anything? Because remember, this is called the SR latch, which is the most elemental device that you can use to store something and it can be changed. But its storing can be changed. Looking at the time, okay, we are almost out of time. So uh, what you can do, okay, you know, yes, go ahead. So okay, so let me let me uh, clarify why we use these you know, why S and R. S is set, R is reset. So one pin is used to set, which means turning something into a one. The other one is used to reset, which means turning something into a zero. And so if you look at S and R, okay, you know, and you look at the two outputs, you can try to make a truth table. So truth table is nothing new to us, okay? We made truth tables for the NAND, we made truth table for AND, OR, and so on and so forth. This one is a little funky because there are times when the actual state of Q and NQ does not depend strictly on the input pins. And that's the memory effect, okay? I don't have enough time today to talk about you know, that portion, so we're gonna talk about that on next Tuesday. It will be very helpful if you just read, finish reading this section here, which is uh, just the SR latch you know, section. Um, and also the, okay, there's one more thing. One more, just one more. <clears throat> so the other thing that can also be helpful if you read it over the weekend, it'll be very helpful, is how we track down the changes in the circuit. So let me go to the the node here, keep going, right there, okay. So this is gonna be helpful, you know, tracking changes, you know, ch tracking change propagation is also going to be a very helpful module. It's super short, okay, I can, I can show you right away how short it is. That's how short it is, it's really just this much, okay? But it is important, because this is how we are going to analyze the memory-based you know, circuit because it has a feedback kind of mechanism. If we cannot just go forward because we have to say, oh, but this is going backwards, okay? It's gonna change something again and that leads to something else you're gonna be changed and so on. So we need a much more systematic way of looking at how changes of one part, you know, affect other parts in the same circuit. This is the description. So what we're gonna do next Tuesday is we're gonna use these instructions here in order to track down the behavior of an SR latch device. So that's why reading both 
would be very helpful before Tuesday. Yes. It, well, propagational delay only has to do with how fast you can overwrite something and how fast you can retrieve you know, something. So it doesn't affect you know, the quantity of what you can do, but it does affect the throughput of how quickly you can change memory. Yep. All right. So this is it for today's lecture. You know, I'm going to upload the lecture right away. I will be at the lab for those of you who want to at least you know, give it a try and see if you can finish it tonight. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>